Good evening friends. Today we will be talking about the basic teachings of Katha Upanishad. As you know the Upanishads are 108 different scriptures and they contain the distilled knowledge of uh, the Vedanta philosophy and uh, Katha Upanishad in particular deals with uh, the dialogue of death. Uh, it's uh, probably best described as Nachiketa going on a date with uh, Yama, the god of death, and then being sent back to earth. So the basic idea <coughs> of Katha Upanishad is to explore uh, the role of Atman uh, in the realm of death and in the realm of life. And uh, today I will like to summarize the teachings of Katha Upanishad as uh, I could uh, fathom based on the uh, readings of various scriptures and amalgamating it with neuroscience based on my own uh, professional uh, understanding. So, the first teaching is to understand what is Atman or the soul, the self. Uh, the Brihadranika Upanishad will tell us that uh, Atman resides in the heart with the ego and there are 101 channels that at the time of death any one of the 101 channels will be activated for the Atma to egress and if it leaves the body through the through the uh, uh, Brihadranika or the Brihadrandra I'm sorry through the aperture that is located between the roof of the palate and the crown as some of them say it's located in the junction of the middle of Langara with the spinal cord in the uh, in the foramen of Manro, middle commissure of the, of the ventricles, that location is where the soul will egress the body through. As some people say, Swami Vivekananda, uh, he, he predicted his own death, that he will be dead before 40. And as they say, when the soul grows and it becomes too high in energy to be contained by the body, then the person will attain Siddhi or uh, Samadhi, Mahasamadhi. Or if the body is too frail, uh, the body energy is too low compared to the, uh, the soul energy as it happens in old age. <clears throat> so it's all about the vibration of the soul. Basically, uh, the soul is indestructible and immutable. It cannot be broken down by any weapon. Uh, as one of the verses in Bhagavad Gita says, Nainam chidanti shastrani, nainam dehati pavaka. Which basically means that uh, nothing can penetrate the soul, nothing can uh, burn the soul and uh, it's not one that can be moistened by water or dried by the air. So if you are thinking like, okay, uh, had a bad weekend, I will wash my clothes and I'll wash my soul in my washer and dryer, put it on high heat in the top loading machine, uh, add some uh, detergents and wash it and then dry it in the top dryer, it's not going to work that way because the soul will remain the way it is. Now, the more important teachings are also meaning to say that the body might die and live, but the soul will not die in you. As they say in Bhagavad Gita, na jiyate na mriyate va uh, it, it does not live and die, it, uh, it is eternal. Uh, it's I am na bhutva bhavita na bhava. It was present not only in the past and the present and the future. It was always present. And aja uh, aja uh, nitya shashvata I am purana na hanyate sharire na hanyate sharire hanyate. So even if the body dies, the soul does not die inside the body and it's always been there is basically what they were saying. So <clears throat> that's the eternity, the immutability and the indestructibility of the soul and uh, how it leaves the body if someone has attained a higher meditation level. So the bigger question that Nachiketa had for uh, Yama, uh, basically Nachiketa was a young prince, so how did he end up in Yamlo? Well his father Vajravasara was uh, a guy who liked to give gifts, 
to gain religious merits and he would give land or he would give away sometimes even futile gifts like cows who could not give milk anymore to the farmers and uh, the farmers were like oh the king has given us a gift let's praise him let's clap him shower praises and uh, garlands and whatever and uh, this is the kind of uh, a version we would have on Facebook today when we do something we post a picture and hit likes and shares and stuff like that so basically trying to gain the rajas uh, guna that is attention craving for the good actions that you do and not doing it from an uh, internal desire to do good because that's the right thing to do the satwa guna anyway so he used to give these ostentatious gifts uh, to gain religious merits and nachiketa confronted him that that you give away these gifts which are futile useless worthless and and you keep doing this thinking that you're doing a good job and uh, i think that made uh, uh, rajas vasara unhappy and he got infuriated and he said my next gift will be you in the hands of yama the god of death and so uh, he made arrangements for nachiketa to leave planet earth and uh, when nachiketa went to yamalok or the place where yama resides uh, yama was out on vacation for like 3 days and uh, uh, nachiketa patiently waited for 3 nights and 3 days and when yama came back he apologized profusely like sir dude i was on a vacation rarely happens bad timing but since you waited for so long i want to give you three wishes i want to fulfill your three wishes give you three boons nachiketa said first make that temporary uh, that uh, mercurial uh, temperament uh, holy person my dad a little bit more understanding and uh, uh, being more accepting of me and yama said sure that will be done and then he said uh, teach me the uh, the heavenly sacrifice so that uh, I can do it the right ritualistic way and go to heaven where there is no death, no pain, suffering, deprivation, nothing. And he says, "Okay, I will teach you the nachiketa sacrifice, which essentially means you have to adore and worship your mom, dad, your teacher, the three uh, people who are most important in your life that shape your soul, and uh, you have to perform the three duties or the dharmas, which is reading the religious, uh, uh, sorry, reading the." Uh, Uh, spiritual scriptures performing your religious duties and also uh, to give away arms to the needy and meaningful arms uh, arms or sacrifices and uh, the last question uh, kind of uh, was the most important question for us in terms of having uh, a spiritual understanding of life and death so nachiketa asks uh, yama Can you explain me what happens after death? Is there a soul, or this existence ends with the end of the body? Now that is a very good question, and uh, Yama was a little uh, flabbergasted and uh, uh, not quite ready to answer that question. So he kind to uh, deflect the question and uh, say that Nachiketa, you are too young, too immature. Uh, you, you can answer something different. Would you like to have? a palatial building hundred sons beautiful uh, family beautiful blonde girls fast cars houses on the beach in beverly hills anything you ask for me i'll give it to you and nachiketa is is like you just told me that life is temporary you took away my life and if i go back down there after few years they'll come back again who wants temporary happiness in life when there's eternal bliss or something more lurking after death so give me the real deal here i don't want those material possessions and the opulence and yeah i thought that uh, this uh, kiro was able to renunciate all the material pleasures that i was offering in search of truth supreme absolute truth and uh, he waited patiently for me three nights so basically this kid has in him uh, to understand and intercept the core concept of death and the things that happen after that because in bhagavad gita it says never teach someone uh, a profound teaching if they're not ready for it because they might not not even understand they might scoff and laugh at it and in that way they are causing more regression of their own soul uh, by by ridiculing it so it's important not to tell people stuff who are not yet ready to listen that was a, a good concept from bhagavad gita anyhow So Yama says after death 
their soul, the immutability of the soul, Nenan Chindanti Shastrani, Nenan Dehati Pavaka, nothing destroys it. It will remain there forever. But uh, the body dies. And uh, there are three things that will determine uh, where you go. Of course, you will have a punarjanam, a reincarnation. You are born back into same species, different species, God knows what. Based on three things, which are uh, your mental state at the time of dying, your desires, unfulfilled desires and emotional cravings, and uh, your logbook of karma. So basically, three areas of the uh, of cycle of life. One is the logbook of karma, which is what your body did, based on your mind directions, and the unfulfilled desires and the emotional cravings in the subconscious. So, say the amygdala, which is the center that processes the emotion in the subconscious brain of the limbic system, that was having some unfulfilled desires, nucleus accumbens, which is the desire providing center of the brain. Uh, it had some unfulfilled desires, it will try to portray, it will try to gain that in the next life. And the third is uh, your state of the mind, what you were thinking at the time of death. And that can happen more at the conscious level. For uh, Gandhiji, when he was shot by Naturam Godse, his last words, his thought turning into speech was, Hey Ram, Hey Ram, Hey Ram. So he's thinking about God even when he's dying and he did not rehearse for it, but he had God in his mind all the time. That's why we say chanting helps because it's trying to bring you in that phase where you're constantly in touch with God and you reflexly say, hey Ram. And uh, so those three things, your mental state at the time of death, what you're thinking about, what your unfulfilled desires, emotional cravings are. And what your logbook of karma is, because every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So, uh, those three things will define your next life. Now, if you have done a lot of good activities, which we'll talk about, then uh, you are liberated. You have attained samadhi, a higher level. Uh, your soul might have exited through the uh, behadrandra, through the aperture between the sagittal sutures through which the soul goes and you don't have to come back. So most people will come back though because of uh, the path they tread in life. So Nachiketa asks, what are those paths and why do people tread one path of coming back uh, versus not of liberation? And uh, Yama explains that everything you do in life, every decision you make in life is either following the path of prayer instant gratification of the senses or shreya which is long term goodness delayed gratification uh, following the conscious mind so think of the existence or anything in the material world into three states sat chit anand sat chit anand sat is existence chit is consciousness and anand is blissfulness so everything that is non-living, even Mahavira and Jainism says uh, the stone has a soul, it has an existence, but it has only one sense organ, as, as Jainism says. But the idea is that it is still in existence, it is. And uh, when it elevates to the next higher level, it's chit, consciousness, we, human beings. Planet Earth, human beings have consciousness. And then there is a higher transcendental level, the anand or the blissfulness, which some of the human beings uh, attain yogis, uh, Mahapurushas will have it, but for the most part people are living at the middle level of chit. So those are the three states. Now the question is, how much of chit or the consciousness we are utilizing the right way to elevate to the blissful level? So Shreya, the path of goodness uses the consciousness as defined by the uh, cortex of the limbic system. So limbic system is the system in the brain that, uh, that processes emotions uh, required for dedication, motivation, reward centers of the brain. So all these complex thought emotion complexes are present in the limbic system. A limbus itself means the junction, merging point between the 
brain and the spinal cord which does things reflexively. So that's the limbic system where your things are there. And the, the two parts are consciousness lying in the OFC or the occipital frontal cortex where all the strong uh, life changing or any conscious thought process decision is made versus the subconscious where the amygdala which processes emotions and the nucleus accumbens which is the reward center of the brain. Now let us know about nucleus accumbens, the reward center of the brain, two things. Uh, a pleasure can manifest as a reward if you use the upper circuits of the consciousness, occipital frontal cortex, good decision making, delayed gratification, your reward. Or instant gratification causing a cycle of addiction to smoking, alcohol, drugs, whatever. Now, there is a famous experiment for delayed gratification. Michelle Walters, uh, Stanford University, 1960, where preschoolers were given one marshmallow. And they were said, if you wait for 15 minutes and not eat this marshmallow right now, I'll come back and give you another marshmallow. So you'll have two marshmallows, but you have to wait for me until I come back. And they leave this kid in this empty room and they're videographing them. And they're seeing like some kids are looking at it, turning away, looking at it more, sniffing it, licking it, and now it's a done deal. The, not long, long, long after the marshmallow is gone. And some people are just not looking at it, not thinking about it, engaged reading a book or doing something different. And so they are playing or not engaging with the marshmallow. So that's the, that's the way to deal with it. If you don't want something to be in your life, you should not think about it. You should not see it. You should not have any access to engaging with your senses in that person. Uh, delete their Facebook profiles, delete uh, them from friend request, uh, don't have anything that will remind you of them if you want someone to be out of your life, if you have decided that. Because decision, cis, comes from the Latin word to cut. Like cesare means to cut the womb, uh, Caesar. So decision is not only opting for one, but cutting out all remaining options. Most people think, oh, it's only about opting for particular preference. No, it's eradicating all other alternatives. And that's why the conscious mind should make that decision, not the sense organs which are just opting for something and not thinking about the 10 different consequences of that decision. So it's important to understand decision says is to cut all the alternatives before picking the preference. Conscious mind, occipital frontal cortex, delayed gratification, the cortex of the limbic system. That's what we should employ for most decisions that we make. Delay, take your time, take a deep breath, hold your breath, think about it and not just jump into it as the senses will want you to do. So that's the, that's the Shreya and the Preya. Uh, and uh, as they say, Tayo Shreyo, Sadhu Dhanasya, which basically means that if you take the path of Shreya, uh, you will be better off. If you tread the path of Preya, uh, you would be uh, falling and you will be eradicated. The soul will fall down. Now, the important thing is to understand, only take what is set aside for you. Tien, Tiyatin, Bhunjita, which means I only take what is set aside for you, not other people's stuff and think about it, look at them and then cause more the tumultuous cycle, the whirlpool of problems. So that's the cycle of Shreya and Preya and how you utilize the frontal cortex uh, of the limbic system to utilize the Shreya. Now the last thing which Nachiketa was taught by Yama was uh, the cycle of life. Very important. Again utilizing the concepts of Shreya and Preya to make decisions and tread the path we tread in life. So, and, uh, as it is said in Bhagavad Gita and in Katha Upanishad that uh, the body should be thought of as a chariot and the driver of the chariot is the intellect, the frontal cortex, the consciousness, the reins which the driver of the charity is holding is the mind. Now if you pull the reins in one direction, the chariot will go in that direction. If you pull the reins in another direction, 
the chariot will go in the other direction. The directions, the roads, are the paths of Shreya, delayed gratification, goodness, sattvic, balance, light, harmony, or prayer, which is short circuit of instant gratification, uh, not thinking of long-term consequences, could be rajasic or tamasic, depending on the tendencies. But those are the two basic paths that the horses or the senses will tread. Now, if you let, if the charity is not in control of the chariot, if the intellect, the consciousness is not in control of the chariot, the horses will take it along the objects of sensual gratification, touch, sight, smell, see, hear, anything that looks good, uh, ice cream, let's eat more of it, chocolates, uh, get in trouble, extramarital affairs, all those things will happen and those have dire consequences on the family structure, on the integrity of the person and of the people surrounding them. So, very important to not let senses make life-threatening decisions and uh, wait and think about it through the ideas of uh, consciousness, frontal cortex, uh, because they have studied, even the marshmallow kids, after 40 years later, they did a study and they found through functional MRI that the brain was lighting up more in the occipital frontal cortex when it comes to decision making. And for the other kids, it was lighting up more in the, uh, in the ventral striatum, where the, where the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala were located. And, and delayed gratification kids, 40 years later, they had better SAT scores, SAT scores, better BMIs, not obese, and better body image, more success in life. So it tells us that frontal cortex decisions are life-changing, long-term decisions, which will bring us happiness. Prayer is always the next big thing. If you have a house of two bedrooms, you want a house of four bedrooms. You have a house on the mountains, you want a house on the beach. You have a Mercedes, you want a Porsche. You have a car, you want a boat. You have one wife, I don't know how many wives and girlfriends you want, the wags. So basically it's more and more, and this down-regulation of the senses, desensitization of the receptors, the happiness triggered is not the same. So you have to go for the intrinsic growth uh, and not the extrinsic money, image and status kind of things which the prayer will lead you to. So uh, the chariot analogy tells us that the horses are the senses, the reins are the mind, the charioteer is the intellect, the conscious mind, frontal cortex. And uh, the horses can be senses are the emotional brain, amygdala, if you will, pleasure seeking nucleus accumbens. And the charioteer will should be driving the chariot now who's sitting in the back of the chariot so the passenger so wherever the paths you tread shreya prayer the soul will be driven along the very subtle powerful thing the day it decides to leave the body the the chariot is dead but uh, the soul decides what uh, the soul goes along with whatever paths we tread there's no good or bad soul the actions are good and bad which will have repercussions through the reincarnations. So those are the basic teachings of uh, Katha Upanishad, basically stating that after that, either reincarnation will happen or liberation will happen. The reincarnation depends upon frontal cortex, state of the mind, subconscious, emotional cravings, desires, and actions committed by the body. And the liberation, of course, through moksha, if you follow the path of Shreya, which is good for the delayed gratification. The path of sacrifices, sannyasa and tyaga, uh, and not of swart or uh, self, me, 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 highness, my highness. Not, not about me, but others. And the uh, chariot analogy, which helps us to understand what decisions we should make in life. Don't let the horses or the senses control your life's directions, the paths you tread in life, or the long term goals you have. But let the intellect, the frontal cortex, your consciousness decide because that way the body will be happy, the soul will be happy. So those are the basic teachings of Katha Upanishad. Please feel free to leave your comments below. Have a nice day. Thank you.